Starring James Cagney and Captains of the Clouds on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Our play tonight is a play of our time, wartime 1942. In it, you will meet a little-known but vastly important race of men, the bush pilots of northern Canada, men who carry freight and medical supplies to the remote outposts of North America, outposts which could not be maintained without these intrepid barnstorming aviators. But we meet these men tonight in wartime, and like most of us, they too have altered their way of living in this year of 1942. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents an all-star cast of Dennis Morgan, Alan Hale, Reginald Denny, Miles Mander, Morton Lowry, and squadron leader Cathcart Jones in Captains of the Clouds, based on Warner Brothers' spectacular new Technicolor motion picture and starring James Cagney on the Cavalcade of America. At trading post in northern Ontario, hunched over Willie's lunch counter, a group of bush pilots take a brief respite between flights. They are joined by Brian McLean, a swaggering red-headed Irishman. The door opens. McLean, speak. On your feet, men. Brian! That's that pirate. Scrounger, you know McLean. Yes, I've met him, but I don't like him. Oh, now, why do you say that? You know, I've always been very happy to see you. Look at Tiny. He never used to like me either. And now he hates me. Oh, come on and sit down. Come on, come on. Willie! Three black coffees and some cake. It's sure good to see you. Now tell me, where's Johnny? I don't know. I haven't seen him. I thought you'd be helping him run that airline by now. Oh, no. I haven't seen him for weeks. I waited for him to come back with Emily and marry her so I could be best man, but he didn't come back. I don't know where he is. I guess he changed his mind. Now, look, uh, are you boys interested in a proposition? Whose back teeth have you stolen now? Oh, no. Come, come. Be big. Look, I've got a little contract pegged out, flying a stamp mill a piece at a time. Now, my plane isn't big enough to handle a job, so if you boys want to chip in a couple of hundred bucks a piece, I'll swap my plane in for a second-hand twin-motor job and... A uh... couple of hundred bucks? Is there that much money? How should I know? Well, the last time I saw you, had 4,000. The last time I saw you, we both had 4,000. What happened to yours? Down the sink. Hey, who's that on the radio? Sounds like Churchill. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Quiet, you fellas, quiet. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island, or any part of it, were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. You've just heard the Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a man who knows how to word an invitation. I don't know how you feel, gentlemen, but I've taken a sudden dislike to these clothes. And as a matter of fact, looking about me, I think we'd all benefit by a change. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but I think I heard something about a government station at Upland. That's the rumor. Well, what are we going to do, waste the rest of the evening sitting here? <laughs> Clear? No, sir, I think not, sir. What is it? Civilian aircraft, sir, coming in for a landing. Why, well, they can't land on an Air Force field. Get out there and signal to them to fly on over. It's too late, sir. They're heading for the runway at the end of the field. The fools they'll crash into those trainers. Come on, maybe we can have them off. Yes, sir. I wonder who they can be, sir. Never mind that now. We've got to save those trainers. They're coming in at high speed, sir. See if you can attract their attention. Wave your arms. Yell. Do something. Hey, the planes. You'll crash the planes. Devil, but the planes are out to get us, I think. Signal the ground crews off the field. What's that you say? I can't hear you. I said run. Run for your life, man. Come on. Hey, Brian. Get a load of this. Hey, that's a pretty little bomber. Lucky we didn't whittle a wing off it coming in. Look here, you men. What in thunder's the idea of gutting in here like a bunch of maniacs? Don't you know this is an Air Force station? We just dropped in to see if we could use some good flyers. Well, the place to apply for the Air Force is the nearest recruiting center. Now, if you'll be good enough to move your ships... Well, they're not in the way here, so we thought... Here we... comes the commanding officer now. Better tell your story to him. What's the trouble, Lieutenant? 
What are these aircraft doing here? They're ours, sir. We're bush pilot. Well, take them back to the bush. Get them out of here anyway. But you don't understand. We know where, where we are, sir. I'd call that a debatable point. Maybe we ought to tell them who we are, Brian. Yeah, yeah. I'm Brian McLean. These are my partners. Best barnstorming pilots in Canada. Tiny Murphy and Scrounger Harris. You, uh, came here to enlist, I take it. We just flew over to see if we could we couldn't help out in this war. Well, we already know everything there is to know about flying. We just want a job to do. Well, I see. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But there's only one way to do a job for the RCAF. Yes, sir. You enlist at headquarters in Ottawa. The address is on every recruiting poster. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, boys, looks like we got a bum steer. Mm, yes, looks like, it. like it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, sir, all this seems a waste of time to me. Here we are, all set to start fighting tomorrow, and we have to go back to Ottawa and fuss around with a lot of red tape. I don't make the regulations, Mr. McLean. Well, hope to see you fellas back here, in uniform. Thanks, Thank sir. You, sir. Yeah, Thank you. you, sir. Sorry we upset your routine. Well, come on, kids, let's get out of here. Be seeing you, General. <laughs> Gentlemen, your attention. Mr. Murphy, Mr. McLean, Mr. Harris, will you step in here, please? That's us. The rest of you better come back tomorrow. The squadron leader not seen any more applicants today. Gentlemen, squadron leader Dutton. Squadron leader Dutton? I say. Johnny! Johnny, old man! The best bush pilot in the business. What are you doing here? Hello, Tiny. Scrounger, come on in. Greetings, sucker. Hello, McLean. Man, this is Flight Lieutenant Fife. Glad to know you, gentlemen. Sit down. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Nice to know you. All right, now, Johnny, let's hear it. What happened to Emily and your airline? You ought to know McLean. When Emily walked out, she took the airline with her, as far as I'm concerned. I joined the RCAF. Mm-hmm. That going to make any difference about my getting into the service? You know it won't. If you make the grade, do the job the RCAF way, I'll do mine. Mm-hmm. That's all. <clears throat> I see. <clears throat> now then, all three of you have had a lot of flying experience. Well, I've had 5,800 hours, and Mac here... You're telling me. And I know you're anxious to get overseas and start tearing hunks out of the Luftwaffe. Johnny, when do we start? That's all we want to know. That's the spirit, Tiny. That's the spirit we need in the RCAF. Well, is that a load off my mind? Your experience will be invaluable in training younger men who are physically able to take a 7G dive without blacking out. Now, just a minute, just a minute. What kind of runaround are you trying to give us, Johnny? No runaround. I'm offering you a chance to take the service training course for instructors. But we signed up because we wanted a fight. Yeah, we're flyers, not kindergarten. Listen, maybe I don't make myself quite clear. We understand, Johnny, we understand, and thanks for the offer. Now, where do we go to get our papers as fighting pilots? I'm afraid that's out of the question, McLean. You see, you're too old. Too old? You're telling me I'm too old? Johnny, you know we've been flying in the bush all winter. Is that a job for old men? I know how you feel. You know how we feel. What does a broken-down chair on the back of a desk know about piloting a plane? Lieutenant Fife will answer that. Mr. McLean, exhaustive medical experiments have shown beyond any shadow of doubt. Exhaustive medical bourgeois. Paper forms, paper forms, and more paper forms. Look at that desktop. Why don't you paper form geniuses turn the Air Force over to flyers and stay home where you belong? I can't, Mr. McLean. My home was in Coventry. Oh. Sorry. That's quite all right. I'm 28 years old, and I'm too old to fly a flight or plane. I found that out at Dunkirk. You fought there? I got on the tail of a Messerschmitt. He dived, and I went after him. When he zoomed out of the dive, we both blacked out. But he was 20, and I was 28. He came out of it. Mm -hmm. All right, General, all right. You win. Where do we go? Manning Depot, Toronto. You'll be put under a drill sergeant. A drill sergeant? That's right. And let me give you a word of advice. You're individualists. So was I. That's all very well and good. Our country needs individualists in peacetime. This isn't peacetime. I'd hate to see you washed up. Mm, Thanks for the advice, General. We can take care of ourselves, I guess. We're old enough anyway. You are listening to a radio adaptation of Captains of the Clouds, starring James Cagney on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, several months have passed. Brian McLean, played by James Cagney, was taken into the RCAF only to be washed out for disobeying regulations. We find him now sitting in the back room of an Ottawa bar, drowning his sorrows in the company of his friend, Tiny Murphy. Mm, washed out. Me, the best push pilot in the whole dominion of Canada. Washed out. Me too, old man. What for? You told me already. I fly by instinct, they say. I don't follow the rules. Bad influence on student pilots. Instinct my foot. I fly by the seat of my pants. That's how I fly, you understand? Me too. Seat of my pants. Mm. But Scrounger made it, though. 
Yeah, Scrounge is Johnny's pet instructor now. Both suckers, if you ask me. Well, I didn't ask you. But say, Brian, I've been meaning to ask you for a long time. Why'd you give Johnny the double cross with Emily? Well, listen, Lunk, and I'll tell you. Emily's been around. She knew Johnny had dough to start his airline. If he'd married that dame, she'd have taken him for everything he had. I tried to talk Johnny out of it. No soap. I tried to talk Emily out of it. Still no soap. That's right. So I did the only thing there was left to do. You mean... Mm-hmm. You're improving. I married the dame, so Johnny couldn't. Where is she now? How would I know? I haven't seen her since the wedding. But don't worry, brother. Wherever she is, Emily's doing all right for Emily. But you'd ought to told Johnny why you'd done it. I told you, Johnny's still a kid. He wouldn't know what I was talking about. Piper, gents. Toronto Star. All the lightest war news. What's the news? All the lightest. Uh, don't worry, it's my war. Well, they my war, too. You know why it is my war? Because I fly by the seat of my pants. Buy a paper from Johnny. All right, here's the dime. Go on away now. Yes, sir. Here's your paper, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll read that. Well, I'm not reading the front page. I'm reading the inside of the local news. What's the news? Hey, Brian, look at this. It's a picture. Who is it? Bishop. Billy Bishop. Mm-hmm. Bishop. There you are. Ace in the other war. He flew at the seat of his pants, and they hung medals all over him. Listen to this. The marshal will visit Uplands tomorrow where he will present wings to graduating airmen of the RCAF. Mm-hmm. Wings. Little white silk wings. What have we got? Well, we still got our old jalopies, and we can fly suckers around any of them guys. Instruments or no instruments? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which gives me an idea. Right. Come on, let's get back to the hotel and try not to sober up. Why? We're going to show those guys tomorrow at their own graduation ceremonies. We're going to show them we can fly. We're going to show them we don't need their nice little white silk wings. And the wings that you young men will wear mean much more than defending your country and your empire. They are symbolic of the fine traditions of this newest of the services and of its great names. Their motto now is yours. The motto of the Royal Canadian Air Force and the RAF. Per ardua ad astra, through hardship to the stars. Their magnificent heritage also now is yours. To fly, to fight, to give everything within you. That there may remain on this earth a land where men are free. Sorry, sir, I can't imagine what those fellows are up to. Take the registration markings of those aircraft. I will, sir. They're obviously civilians. I say, that was uncomfortably close. I wonder who on earth they can be. Very possibly bush pilots. Well, they're certainly experienced flyers. But what can they be doing here? Here they come again, in a vertical dive. One is diving too steep. He'll never pull out of it. He'd better pull out now. It's suicide. Stop it. Stop it, man. Pull out! Adjutant, send over an ambulance. Don't look at that mess. It's too late for an ambulance, sir. Oh, they'll have it all clear in a moment. Then perhaps we can identify the pilot. Uh, there we are. Yes, he's dead, the poor fool. Why, it's tiny. You know who it is, Quadron Leader Dutton? Why, uh, he looks familiar, sir. I believe he was a bush pilot. Oh, yes. By the way, you were a bush pilot too, weren't you? Why, why, yes, sir. Why do you ask? Well, I thought you might be able to identify this plane. I know the plane, sir. It belongs to a man named Popcorn Kearns. I see. Well, there's not much left of the plane or Kearns either. Better notify the civilian authorities. Yes, sir. We will now carry on with the wing's presentation. On with the helmets, on with the motor, tune him up and let him sing. Take him off and let him swing a Painting a V across the sky. A V for a victory by and by. We're off for the big show tonight. So fly him wing to wing. We're angels of hell and we fight. For country and for king, we're captains of the cloud. Let her roll it away. Hit the sky again, fly again, fly again. Kill the flag and fly again, captains of the cloud. We're off for the big show tonight. So fly and wing to wing. We're angels of hell and we fight. Country and for kings, we're captains of the cloud. 
Hey, Johnny, you're in very fine form tonight, you know. A good beginning to a long and hilarious evening. Right, Scrounger. Tonight's our night to howl. Exactly. This is the first relaxation we've had for over two months now. Special announcement. Special announcement of great urgency. All staff officers ought to report back to the station immediately. What's up, Waterley? I don't know, but it's something pretty urgent. They want all available staff pilots and instructors right away. Come on, Scrounger. Things seem to be popping. Oh, dash it all. My first rail outing for months and I don't even get to the soup course. <laughs> Everybody in? Yes, sir. All officers are present, sir. Close the door, someone. <coughs> Gentlemen, I've got a bit of bad news. Two transport planes carrying 44 transatlantic pilots to Canada have crashed. This could hardly have occurred at a worse time because we've just received a call for every available Lockheed Hudson bomber to be sent over at once. Fortunately, we have the aircraft and pilots to send. You men are among them. That is all, except for this. I cannot stress too strongly the vital and immediate necessity of getting those bombers over. No obstacle, breakdown, weather, enemy action must stop you. You've got to get them over. You're leaving for the Newfoundland taking off place at once. <laughs> Brook, Philip Handel. That's me. Dover Squadron Leader Dutton. Yes, sir. You and Francis Patrick Murphy. That's me, sir. Sergeant, there must be some mistake here. This man. Oh, is... Johnny, remember me? My name is Murphy. Of course I do, but. Uh... I was watched out as an instructor, remember? What they say I do for this emergency. You're quite sure your name is Murphy? Quite sure, sir. I see. Oh, Cranbrook, you fly aircraft 39. It's warming up on the field. Yeah, yeah, okay. Step in the office, Murphy. We'll talk this over. Yeah, anything you say? Well, go ahead. Sound off. This ought to make you feel pretty good. Sure does. We have a few things to straighten out. Well, now, let's try to stick to one of them, huh? Do I fly that bomber? There's something else. Uh... Not for me, there isn't. Then why are you trying to pass yourself off as tiny? Listen, fella, I'm all washed out of flying on this side of the ocean. I know that. For the RAF, I may get a crack at a new start. And there's one slim chance I can get even for tiny. For tiny? You knew I was in the other plane, didn't you? Doing the aerobatics to bust up your graduation ceremony? Yes. Well, it was my fault, the whole thing. It was just a crazy, drunken idea. I hadn't any thought that... You took a big chance, Brian, coming in this way. My only chance. I went through Tiny's things at the hotel afterwards. He had no relatives, nobody, so I, I took his papers and here I am. But I'm taking that bomber across and nobody's going to stop me. Do you get that? Nobody. Nobody will. Thanks. About that other thing, Brian, the day Tiny crashed, he wrote me a letter. Well? He explained about you and Emway. Let's forget it, huh? It's my turn to say thanks, Brian. What are you trying to do? Make me out a hero or something? Something like that. Anyway, in case I forget to tell you, your navigator is Scrounger. Scrounger? Wonderful! <laughs> I'm a fool letting two bush pilots go on the same plane, but it's too late to make other arrangements now. You won't be sorry, Johnny. I have a feeling I won't. But listen, you. Keep your eye on those dials. You can't fly the Atlantic with the seat of your pants. <laughs> Corrigan did. Scrounger, getting closer all the time. Yes, all downhill from now on. Look, Scrounger, I'm wide awake. Why don't you pull that cot thing down and get yourself some sleep? Oh, I'm not tired. I don't want to miss the first sight of England. I'll call you when we pass Ireland. Ireland! All out for Ireland! Next stop, England, change for the ball in subway. Oh, oh that's very good, old boy. By the way, Scrounger, how long have you been away? Oh, 12 years. It's going to be nice getting back, you know. I always had a hunch I'd never see England again. And then this chance popped along. Shows how much a fellow can depend on hunches. Well, what's it like? What's England like? Tell me, uh, anything like the pictures you see in oh, books? Yes, yeah, sort of. Some of it. Narrow lanes, big hedges, thatched cottages and gardens and so on. Oh, yes. All of that and other things, too. The scent of lilacs and the sound of larks si singing against the sky. They're beastly little nuisances, but nice. You'll be sniffing those lilacs another hour or so. You know, Scrounger, I've been thinking. 
I'd like to skip right over England and fly straight to Berlin. Yeah, that's why they fitted these things unarmed. I say, Brian, if we should meet up with a Nazi fighter out here, what are we supposed to do? What would you suggest? I don't know. I don't like to think about it. And think about seeing England. We'll be sighting land any minute now. Yeah. Scrounge you. Scrounge you. Look up ahead there, just inside those clouds on the left. Yes, well. See anything? Well, do you? I'm not sure. I thought I saw a reflection of something shining. Where? I still don't see anything. Look sharp, Scrounge. Just see? Just topping that cloud bank on the left. Brian! Brian, it is! It's a Messerschmitt! Attention, squadron. Enemy aircraft sighted. Do not break formation. Hello, hello, Johnny, listen. Is there anything we can do? Don't break formation. Just keep flying, that's all. Mm, fine thing. There's not much we can do. After all, these things have got no guns on them. Listen, listen, it's attacking one of the ships ahead. I can't see it very well for those clouds. Listen, listen. He's got one! You'll get another. Brian, Brian, what are you going to do? You know, don't you? Yes, I do now. Well, what do you say? Yes. Yes, we've got to. You'll never see those lanes and hedges and sniff those lilacs again. Oh, bother the lilacs. This is the chance we've both been praying for. Then hold everything, fellow. Messer Schmidt, here we come. Uh, number 21. Number 21. Number 21, go ahead, Johnny. What are you doing, Brian, you fool? I should have known better than to trust you out here. Rejoin the formation at once. Sorry, Johnny, I've got a job to do. I'm going to get me a Messer Schmidt. Rejoin formation, do you hear me? Sorry, I can't see you. Too many clouds. Where are you? About 100 feet above the Messer Schmidt. If you listen real hard, you'll hear a big crash in about 10 seconds. Sorry to disobey orders, but this is the last time. Sniff a lilac bush for Scrounger and me, will you? So long, fella. Here comes our messenger, Scrounger. He sees us, Scrounger, but it's too late. Too late. Move over, Tiny. Here we come. Landfall bearing 020 degrees. Straight ahead of you, gentlemen, is England. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight on the seas and on the beaches. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. Thank you, James Cagney, for your performance in Captains of the Clouds on Cavalcade of America. And thank you, Dennis Morgan, Alan Hale, Reginald Denny, Miles Mander, Squadron Leader Owen Cathcart-Jones, and Morton Lowry. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, we will hear again from our star, James Cagney. But first, Gane Whitman would like to tell you something about the best-dressed army in the world. In the ringing slam and crash of great steel plates, in the deafening clatter of riveting work... Men are building more ships today than we have ever built before. Far down inside murky holes, their eyes wince from the purple rocket flare and yellow sparks of arc welders, from the blazing glare of high-power incandescent bulbs. In winter, the steel is freezing cold. In summer, the confined space is reeking, deafening furnace. Only one thing makes the work at all bearable to human flesh and blood, fresh air. How to get fresh air continuously down to men working inside a ship in dry dock or on the ways, how to blow out the air that has grown foul, has long been a troublesome problem. Today, when new keels are laid as greased ways still smoke from the launching of the latest ship, the problem of air is more vital than ever before. We bring you news that DuPont engineers have found a way to send clean air to these men at work building American ships. No matter how dark and deep the cranny inside the ship, even if a man has to crawl into it on his hands and knees, he can now take his supply of fresh air along with him. For down to him is sent a giant air hose, a flexible tube of chemically treated, impregnated fabric, DuPont vent tube. The entire hold of a ship under construction may be ventilated by mounting a power fan above deck and dropping a length of vent tube down to the bottom of the ship, or the fan may be set in the hold and foul air blown out through the vent tube. DuPont vent tube has been used in mine tunnels for 24 years. It is made of cotton fabric, treated with chemicals, and coated to give it resistance to heat, moisture, mildew and decay, acids, alkalis, and gases. The tubing is impregnated with a compound that helps keep air in and water out and gives it great toughness. 
Some vent tube is the diameter of a small tree. Some of it as big around as a barrel. Sections of it may be coupled together like a fire hose. It can be any length needed if the blower fan is powerful enough. If by accident a hole is drilled through it, or it is burned with an acetylene torch, the puncture can be repaired in the same way the inner tube of an automobile tire is patched. Underground tunnel workers and miners have known Ventube for years as a trustworthy friend. Because Ventube works so well in mines, DuPont engineers quickly asked, why wouldn't it work equally as well down in the holds of ships? So in the roar and rattle and bang of a shipyard, they lowered a smooth gray tube into the darkness of a hold. And far down in brilliant glare and black shadow, riveters and welders drew into their lungs fresh, sweet air. Ask the men who are building the ships. They'll tell you Ventube earns its name as one of the DuPont chemists' better things for better living through chemistry. And now, tonight's star, James Cagney. I, uh, I want to take this opportunity to greet the men in the RCAF and thank them again for their help in making Captain to the Clouds. I mean, Billy Bishop, Bill McBrien, and all the rest. At Uplands, Toronto, Jarvis, Trenton, and Halifax, they worked with us magnificently. And all of us are very grateful. Well, it's certainly an exciting picture, Jimmy. When will it be out? It's to open in New York February 12th, and I think there's a little story about that that shows how much all of us felt the picture meant, yeah. not only to the flyers, but to the public. For in spite of war conditions, they will open not only in New York, but simultaneously in Ottawa, Cairo, Melbourne, and London. Thanks again to the RCAF and the RAF, prints were flown in their bombers to all four countries. Good work, I call it. Well, it certainly was, Jimmy, and thanks a million. You were swell. <laughs> Next week, Cavalcade presents again an epic story of America, a story which has won America's acclaim on the air, on the stage, and as a book. It is the story of Abraham Lincoln, adapted by Robert E. Sherwood from Carl Sandburg's great biography, Abraham Lincoln, The War Years, starring Raymond Massey. In again presenting this play on the week of Lincoln's birthday, Cavalcade believes that the story of America's great war president more than ever today will be a source of courage and inspiration to his countrymen. On tonight's program, James Cagney appeared by special arrangement with Warner Brothers, producers of Captains in the Clouds, his latest starring vehicle. Original music was composed and directed by Robert Armbruster. Don't forget, next week on Cavalcade, Raymond Massey in Abraham Lincoln, The War Years. This is John Heaston sending best wishes from DuPont. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.